Welcome back, everybody. And if you weren't here this morning, then just welcome. Glad that you're here. Um, there is music playing coming out of the ceiling. If you hear it, I'm aware. We're all aware. Um, we don't know why it's not being cut off. But so it's, it's background music, I guess, for as I'm speaking. So we have a lot to do in the 45 minutes that we have together. But while you're eating, I'm going to just share some more information. But then once we're done eating, I've got a series of activities for us to do that you can begin applying um, immediately as you're working with uh, your clients and your patients. So let me jump in here. So I always like to start with us thinking about who we're serving. And this is uh, data taken directly from Cradle Cincinnati's website. So this is your information about what's going on in, in your area. And you'll notice that you have concentrated pockets, if you will, uh, where, where um, and this is maternal smoking rate. This is not the general population. So where we have mothers who are uh, active smokers. The dark blue represents uh, somewhere between uh, 20%. Um, it says to no less than 60%, so that's a pretty wide range. And if you're looking at uh, Hamilton County, you can see that um, we have a lot of dark blue going across our border, right, with Kentucky or across the river, however you want to think about that. And then in the westernmost pocket of your county, and the reason I put this up here is to say that when we're working with groups of people, the reason we get to know them and think about things about like where they live, again, tells us a lot about what might be going on uh, with the norms of their neighborhood, of their family, with them culturally. So maternal smoking is impacting people very differently across your county, with you know some places being in that very, very light blue color, and then other places in this darker blue, and it's kind of all over. So again, this is interesting information. Now, what would be even more interesting is to take this map and lay over top of it data about your infant mortality, right? To see what coincides. I'm sure there would be a lot of overlap. Another data point to add to that, which would also be equally interesting, would be what your suicide rates are by census tract. And then what your opiate overdose or opiate incidence rates are by census tract. And without really knowing what I'm talking about, meaning I haven't looked at any of this data, my guess is there'd be a lot of similarities in terms of who's affected, right? And when we think about that and we add interesting information about transportation, access to services, let's say on this map we put where all of our primary care clinics are and perhaps where our jobs and family services office is and where our bus routes run and all of that, you start to see this idea, for those of you who work in, in public health, this concept around social determinants of health and your zip code predicting so much of your health activity so that we can say, okay, as I'm working with my patients, I, I got to understand where, where are they coming from? What is normalized based upon where they live? What are they seeing day in and day out? What might be causing additional stressors? So it's wonderful that you have this information. A lot of uh, counties do not. I can tell you, um, I couldn't find this from Franklin County where I live, uh, Columbus. So this is powerful information to have. So there was a, an issue brief that came out in February of this year looking back um, across the United States at cigarette smoking during pregnancy. And of course, when data comes out from the feds, it's usually a year or two old, so they're looking at data from 2016, but they, they just completed uh, the analysis. And uh, these are some snippets from that document uh, for you um, about what, what we're still seeing. And we know that it varies greatly throughout the United States, rates of, of smoking. And here's Ohio in a, in a nice shade of blue, not the worst by any means. We have higher smoking rates in, uh, of course, our neighboring states of West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, and then also, uh, as you look down, we've got higher rates in the south, but really high rates in the, the, the southwest corner of the United States. But across all of that, um, their findings indicate that 
if we're going to look at people just across the spectrum, it's about 7% of women giving birth who admit, at least, to smoking during pregnancy. But when you then break it down and say, but, but who is that? It's really young women who are your heaviest smokers. And so what they saw from this data set was women aged 20 to 24 were your highest group of people who are still smoking during pregnancy, followed then by an even younger subset of women, 15 to 19. And then the third largest group is this 25 to 29. So if we were to take that all together and say, well, who is likely um, the, to, to need our help the most? It's really anybody from that teen age, so the 15, up to someone who's almost 30 years old. So this is very much young people in many cases. And so that, again, proves interesting uh, as we think about generationally how we've seen changes in smoking and tobacco-related behavior. Now, if we think about uh, other demographic factors like ethnicity, what they see across the country um, is that non-Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaskan Native women have the highest prevalent smoking rate during pregnancy. 16.7%. And then the lowest prevalence are non-Hispanic Asian women who are less than 1% smoke. And if you know something culturally, you know that that, that is true in general uh, with, with people who identify from Asian culture, lower rates of smoking for women, not for the men, but for the women. And then there are multiple um, health concerns happening in the Native American and Alaskan Native communities, um, not only with smoking, but uh, alcohol. Uh, rates of alcohol use and other things during pregnancy. Um, the, and then the third data point on here that I thought was important for us to think about was that the prevalence of smoking during pregnancy was highest among women with a completed high school education, 12.2%, and second highest among women with less than a high school education, 11.7%. So what this tells us is that our intervention really is going to be a family intervention. So a lot of these young women are still living at home with parents supporting them. And so again, I, I ask you to always think about not just the person who's sitting in front of you, but their little slice of the world. And what could be contributing? What's a strength for them? What's a barrier for them? What goes on in this school, this neighborhood, et cetera, where, um, where it seems to be normalized to be OK to smoke and, and engage in other substances. So what's amazing to me, having been an outsider here today, like I said, I live in Columbus, is this consortium gathering here today is so impressive. There are a lot of people here from across disciplines, across systems, and you're all talking about the same thing, which is this focus on children being able to thrive and, and supporting families, and that's tremendous because what we find is Sometimes we're in silos and we don't, even though we might have a common goal, we don't know we have a common goal. And so if you know that you have what I would call a young person problem, right, YPP, what are we doing with schools, right? What are we doing to help engage where young people tend to convene and hang out and get that message across um, about not smoking during pregnancy? And honestly, how about just not smoking, right? So it'd be great if you could quit while you were pregnant. It would be even better if you could quit and stay quit. The mic just got much louder, didn't it? OK. There's a point in the day where you're like, and I'm losing my mind. OK, in front of a group. All right, so I like to check in. Um, a little bit more data just to share with you while you're eating. Again, uh, 1 in 14 women who gave birth reported smoking. These are some of our data. We know states that have the highest rates, West Virginia, Kentucky, our neighbors. Um, and then interestingly, Montana, there's a lot of uh, reservation, Native American um, reservations out there. And then the outlier, Vermont. But if you know something about Vermont, you also know they have just been beleaguered by the opiate epidemic too. And most people who are addicted to other substances began their journey with smoking. So uh, that isn't actually all that shocking. And then Missouri. Um, and Missouri and Ohio are actually very similar on a lot of different levels. So this is where we're seeing these like preponderance. And then um, it was lowest in Arizona and California, um, Connecticut, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, Nevada, Texas, Utah, and DC. They each had a prevalence of less than 5%. So that's interesting in itself. Um, and again, here's our group, these 20 to 24, um, but really, you know, Starting at the age of 15, the numbers are too high. But as a woman gets older, at least from a federal perspective, when they were looking at this large data set, the 
it declined with increasing maternal age. So as a woman gets older, she's less inclined to smoke during pregnancy. What I don't know, and what sometimes these reports don't tell you, are what are kind of the covariates? What else might be going on in, in her life? Is it because as she ages, this is not her first pregnancy, you know, um, that she's got other health concerns? I don't know, and those would be questions that I would ask of the data. Sometimes just age changes how we think about things and what we want to do. So it could just be that fact of, you know, settling down or, or whatever. Um, women aged 45 and over uh, had lower rates of smoking. Uh, I would also say they, uh, their pregnancy numbers tend to not be as high as everyone else's, so that's an interesting data point. Um, and then those 15 and under uh, being pregnant um, were also a low, low rate. So again, this is a national data set just to frame some things. Breaking it out again via um, other demographics like ethnicity, and this is all data that I've shared. So this issue of treating tobacco is, is finally, because I've been doing this work, this will be my 20th year kind of in and around this field, finally you're starting to see more and more disciplines say, yep, smoking is not just a dirty habit, it's something we need to address. So as it changes though, we have, we have had to um, expand our horizon on not just saying smoking cigarettes, but we know people use electronic devices, they use vaping, all these things. And so recently, ACOG just revised uh, last year their um, kind of committee opinion about smoking cessation during pregnancy and added, and it's color coded to show you what they added, information about electronic cigarettes. So as people are coming to you and saying, well, would that be safer? You know, um, there's data emerging, but they, they're starting to make statements about that. So you're seeing more and more positions being taken on the importance for addressing um, tobacco use, and now we'd have to say nicotine use, um, because again, electronic devices are not tobacco-based, they're nicotine-based, and a whole bunch of other chemicals. So, but the, my point is, before, where you might have felt like the only person talking about it, it's starting to shift, which is important. So when the society's message gets together and says, this is important to us, we need to address it, that helps shift things. So as society changes, we change, we hope to help the client change, right? And so when we're using motivational interviewing, what we're trying to do is tune our ear to moments of change talk, meaning what is a person saying or doing that indicates to me that they're starting to move forward, okay? So what am I, what am I looking for? So if our goal is to help somebody cut down or quit, what tells me that they're moving towards that goal? So oftentimes, people will set a change goal for themselves. What do you want to have happen? What are, you, what are you driving towards? And what we have to help them know is that there's multiple ways to get there. Okay, we don't all have to do this the same way. Uh, you don't have to take the same steps that your friend took. Your pathway is unique. And then what we're guarding against and also keeping an eye out for is moments when they start talking that signals to us they're moving backwards. And that's thought of as sustained talk, meaning what am I doing that signals that I'm going to not progress forward and kind of sustain the place where I'm at right now. And, and, and it's favoring the status quo. And I will tell you, if you are familiar with the stages of change, who's heard that before? You know, while you're eating, raise your other hand. Yeah, okay. So you know that the stages of change really thinks about people progressing through a phase called pre-contemplation, which I would describe as I don't have a problem, you have a problem because you brought it up. That's what a pre-contemplator is. It's not in their world, it's not in their frame of reference. If we can do some things that are non-threatening and plant some seeds, in theory, we move them into this stage called contemplation, which means I'm not doing anything about it, but I'm at least willing to hear you. And a contemplator is somebody uh, who you have to be very gentle with, again, plant some seeds because they're not ready to take action. The third phase in the stages of change is something called preparation. And preparation still doesn't mean you're doing anything to change, it means you're gathering information. So a person in preparation is really, really fragile because in, a person in preparation is going to say some change talk and some sustained talk at the same time. Because they're going to say things like, well, I was looking at those medications that you talked about and I think they could help me, but I'm really worried that they might make me feel weird. And I was thinking about that whole uh, talking, you know, talking to somebody to get some support, but I don't really have anybody in my life who can do that. So they're swinging back and forth. So a person in preparation is just gathering information. They're still not making any change. 
And it's a sensitive time because I will tell you the people that they ask advice from are not us. They talk to their friends and they say to their friend, didn't you quit smoking like a year ago? And the friend says, uh, yeah, yeah, I did. And they say, well, what did you do? And she'll say, well, I'll tell you what not to do. Okay, if they try and put you on any of those medications, you tell them, no way, because I felt terrible and I didn't like it at all and it made my stomach hurt. And they, oh no. So then they take a step back. So in preparation, know that like many of us, if you're thinking about buying a car, you probably make this mistake called if you're thinking about a Toyota, you look at somebody at work who owns a Toyota and you say, you like your car? And they say, I hate this car. Eh, you've crossed it off the list. That person may not be qualified to judge cars. They may know nothing about cars, but you like them and trust them. Therefore, their word is gospel. Okay. It's the same thing with health change behavior. Okay. So we have to recognize that and know that, hey, there's a lot going on. And if we can get them through preparation, then they go into this land called action, which is hard. And I say it's a land because it's like taking a really long, long journey uphill when you are actively changing. And action lasts for about six months to a year before something feels normal. So that first year of quitting smoking doesn't feel normal. It's like, oh, you remind yourself, I don't smoke anymore. That's right. Um, and then it seems like after about a year, if you've had a, a good experience, it gets easier and you move into that last stage called maintenance. But along that way, and maintenance still has a ton of work in it, you have to maintain the change, people will either be talking about moving forward or they'll be talking about moving backwards. And we just want to be cognizant of that. So how do you know somebody's starting to show signs of readiness for change? Well, one, they're less resistant. That doesn't mean they walk in and say, I'm so happy I'm here. Let's get this party started. It, but it might mean that they don't give you the evil eye when you walk in the room. It might mean that they didn't say no immediately. They might start asking some questions. There might be some decreased discussion about the problem, why this thing won't work for them. They might have a little bit more resolve, like they sound a little bit more confident in, them, in themselves. They might actually start talking about the change, like literal change talk. You know, I was thinking about when I quit. I was doing the math, and uh, I'm going to save X amount of dollars. That's change talk. Um, they might start asking you better questions about the process. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned that there was this group. Uh, what, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about that again? They might start envisioning their future. You know, I was really thinking about how nice it'll be to not have cravings anymore. I was thinking about how great it would be to not be worried about, like, smoking in front of the kids. You know, so they start to picture the future. But kind of the biggest one for me that I would see is experimenting. And they do this without your permission. So they've talked with you and they've told you they're not ready to do anything yet. And then the next time they come and see you, they toss something out like they say, oh, by the way, I, uh, I quit smoking in my car um, and, and, and uh, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> so they've started to test the water themselves um, or they went out and bought some nicotine gum. OK, you know, maybe we hadn't even talked about that. And they said, well, I tried that gum and it kind of helped me. So they're, they're testing the water. And so these are all signs that people are ready to move forward. So when you're thinking about talking to folks again and asking them questions about where they are in the process, you're kind of thinking through four different things with them. One is, what's their desire? You know, what do they really want? And, and when, when people start talking about like their future and what they want for themselves and their health, you're going to hear things like, I wish, I want. I would like for, I would, you know, and so they start to um, kind of put their, their wishes, their wants, their desires out there. Second type of change talk that you'll often hear is really around that concept of confidence that we were talking about this morning. So you're going to start hearing things like, I think I could, I could do that. I think I'd be able to give that a try. I think I can do that. So they're kind of testing themselves and, and just putting a little piece out there saying, yeah, I think I could, I could try that. Um, reasons are always very important because it'll be the, their if-then motive for change. You know, I know that if I quit smoking, um, my health insurance is going to cost less. Or I know if I quit smoking, my child's going to have less ear infections. Or I know if I quit smoking, I'm going to save money. It's those if-then reasons. And then finally is this idea of need. Um, and this is when people will talk about this, like, imperative for change. Like, I have to do this or this thing is going to happen. So I'll give you an example of, of, I've heard grandparents say, like, I have to quit smoking or my daughter told me I won't be able to hold the baby. Um, and that's the final cooker for them, you know. 
um, or I really need to quit smoking, my kids notice and they're asking questions. They're getting to the age where it's much harder to hide from them. Um, so you, you, it's a push. So it's, um, the difference between desire and need is often need is external. I need to do this because, you know, my daughter said I can't hold the baby, or my kids are noticing, or my workplace is going tobacco free. Desire is more internal. I want, I wish, I would like. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So again, the essence behind that, why we take the time to say to somebody, why, you know, what are the reasons for doing this? It's because we're trying to help them make their own argument for change. It has to matter to them. Like I shared with you this morning, the reason I'm tobacco free now for 18 years is because I do the work every day. I'm the one who chooses not to be sneaky and bum a cigarette. I'm the one who asks for help when I need it. I'm the one who makes those choices to not pick back up. And you have to have your own sense of ownership and meaning that comes from that. I know why I don't do it. Um, and, and that's what we need to instill. So it can't be about your reasons. Um, it has to be about theirs for it to work. So you can help them think of some good reasons, but if they aren't coming up with their own reasons, their own desires, their own needs, then it's not gonna matter. They're doing it to please you in your office and the change is not gonna last. And the only way we get this argument for change to come forward is by engaging with them. So bottom line, it comes back down to us again. What kind of space are we creating for people how are we engaging in dialogue with them that allows them to tell us the truth? That's what this comes down to. So that they can say things like, I hate this. It needs to be, it needs to be all right to say that, you know? Or this is really hard for me. Or actually, this has been easier than I thought. Or, you know, I was doing so great and um, everything fell apart. That's humiliating <laughs> to have to come back and say that um, after you've been doing well. And what we want to do is cultivate that sense that I am going to continue to serve you regardless because I have an end goal in mind, and I know that you might not get it on the first try. So we'll try, try, and try again. When we encounter resistance, uh, that pushback from the client, um, it's a signal to us that they are uncomfortable, okay? And sometimes what we're sensing is discord, and discord is really this interpersonal behavior that lets us know that there's dissonance in our working relationship. So if they start arguing with you, interrupting you, discounting you or ignoring you, know that they're trying to tell you something's off, okay? They're actually not purposefully trying to be rude. I know that that's hard to believe sometimes, but many times people don't know how to say the following. You know, I'm feeling really vulnerable right now, and um, therefore when you say these things to me, it triggers my sense of anxiety about my fear of failure which uh, puts me in a very uncomfortable place where I do not feel safe and it connects me with some childhood memories of uh, my mother being critical and uh, my second grade teacher who told me I would never become something. Okay, that's what's going on on the inside. They don't have those words. Instead, they just say things like, that'll never work for me. Or they come after you for a minute. Well, did you ever smell? Right? Uh, you don't look like the beacon of health. I've heard that before. It's like, well, damn. <laughs> um, let me move that candy dish off my desk into the drawer. Okay. okay. Friends, they've said it all. I've heard, I feel like at this point, I've heard it all. Um, in that moment, they're actually not trying to be hurtful. They're trying to get the focus off of them and push it back. And so just take it as a signal. Hey, I might have gone too fast step too far, let me draw it back. And when we can do that and recognize it, we're going to be able to switch gears and be able to say, okay, you know what, let me, let me just take a step back real quick. You know, when you first came in, we started talking, um, I really felt like we were getting somewhere and I think, and I always put the blame back on myself, I think I've misread or misjudged something and, and I sense that I've said something that maybe has made you uncomfortable. I'm sorry, and let's, let's go ahead and get ourselves back on track. And usually that's enough to diffuse the moment or they're able to say, you know, it's not you, it's just I've been dealing with so much and I just found out from, uh, and this is, you know, remember our clients who have Medicaid are constantly dealing with change, disruption, and all sorts of craziness. So they could have just come in to see you and found out they got some letter that, that their, um, their benefits didn't get approved or their food stamps are being cut or something's not, you know, coming right. So they've got all this stress on them and then here we are and they need to deflect it. So sometimes that's what comes out at us. 
So it's just a signal to us, step back and switch up what you're doing. So now that most of you have eaten, correct? Okay. If you don't like having your plate in front of you, the trays are fairly crowded. There's still a couple over here, but my understanding is uh, the, uh, the, the ladies who were helping serve the food may come around and take your tray. We are going to do some exercises together. So the first one I will actually do up here, since a lot of you still have plates, but hopefully we get some tables clear because we're going to do some work together with some writing. So first thing, let me see if I can get my traveling mic to come on. Is this working? Okay. So I'm going to ask for some help passing out the first handout. <clears throat> thank you. It's this one. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Don't look at the slides. I'm going to do some things out of order because we don't have uh, all of our plates cleared. So we're not doing scaling just yet. We're doing something different. right here. I have not seen the ladies come back to clear plates. I didn't. They <laughs> yeah. I think nearly everybody has the handout and it you'll see at the top it's called the decisional balance does everyone have it did any tables get skipped you have it you're looking right at it yeah yeah so it's it looks like four quadrants it might say decision making worksheet at the top but it's this what I've drawn up here and what you see on the screen correct everybody good okay so I'm actually going to do this activity on the flip chart. I know you're thinking, Gretchen, that's really far away and it's very small. You have the handout in front of you. So just listen if you can't see and it'll all come together, okay? So when Dr. Selby was working with Gene in the video, he did this exercise, part of it verbally. I like to do it uh, with a paper in front of me or if I'm doing group. I draw it up on a, a, a flip chart like this or on a whiteboard because this becomes a very interesting activity one-on-one -on -one or with a small group of people. So the, where we want to start and how these quadrants are laid out is important, okay? So first thing I want you to notice is language. It says good things about smoking, not so good things about smoking. Notice it does not say positive and negative and it doesn't say good and bad. So our language is important so that we aren't creating this uh, sense of um, what you're saying is wrong. So it's good and not so good things. And then on the second half, it's the not so good things about quitting and the good things about quitting. This is different from a pros and cons list. A pro and con list only gets half of the picture. The decisional balance asks you to really look at all four quadrants in any change process. So you always start first with the safest place, which is the good things about smoking. So when you're working one-on-one, -on -one, you should be the scribe while the client is talking. And the idea is you ask them, so what are some of the good things about smoking? And as they list them off, you are writing them down. So let's just do this together. So what are some good things about smoking? Think from the smoker's perspective. Shout it out. It helps with my stress, and then I heard calms my nerves. Okay, one second, let me get these down. Calms nerves, I heard um, fitting in. And then did I hear something about food? Okay, curbs my appetite, keeps me from eating. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you? I still can't hear you. Saves them? 
From what? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Way in the back. Did you have one back there? Okay. So they say, well, it keeps me from doing other things, right? What are some other good things about smoking? Yeah. Any, if there are any former smokers in the room, what did you like? I'll tell you that it helped me with my anxiety. It made me feel less anxious. Yeah, it's an excuse to take a break, go outside. It's my routine. It's part of my routine. It used to help me concentrate. Like it felt like it cleared my mind. So what you do while the person is talking is you use that reflective listening skill of repeat. So the whole time they're talking, you say it right back. Okay, so it helps you with this. It helps you with that. And then you use the open-ended question, what else? What else? What else? And what will happen is this box will get pretty full. And once it gets to that pretty full moment, you're going to say, okay, so the good things about smoking. It helps us relax, helps us with stress. It calms our nerves. We fit in. It's an excuse to take a break. I feel less anxious. It keeps my appetite down. Boy, it saves me from getting mad and carrying on with other people. It's part of my routine. It helps me concentrate. It keeps me from doing other things. And, uh, you know, frankly, it looks cool. Okay? In this moment, there's no judgment. There's no contradiction. There's not a wrong answer to have. And then you're going to say to them, okay, let's flip the coin. What are some not so good things about smoking? Yeah. Smell. Breath. It's expensive. What else did I hear? My health. I'm getting some wrinkles. Yo, and my teeth are stained. I can't taste food. My appearance. Well, you know what? Someone just said it's offensive to non-smokers, and you're hearing that more and more. They'll say, um, my children complain. You know, they're getting it more from family, so they're dealing with complaints. They feel embarrassed. They feel sometimes like uh, they have to, like a smoking vampire, like they have to go hide somewhere and smoke under the cloak of darkness. Um, and they will also say, um, there is nowhere to smoke, right? They'll say, well, then there's nowhere to even go. So there's less places to go. Yes, they feel like a social outcast, right? And then from their perspective, they may say, but I'll tell you this doesn't always come up. They may say, well, it's harder to breathe and I can't do other things. But I'm telling you, those come up few and far between. It's these social and emotional things that are going to show up first, which again, for those of us working in health, we've got to get okay with that, that people don't think about their health. It might seem bizarre, but it's the truth. They don't. So those can pop up. Same thing as it fills up. We're going to repeat it back and then just say, okay, so they're not so good things about smoking. There is an odor. I know my breath smells bad. Um, it's so expensive now. I'm spending an arm and a leg. I'm having some health impacts. I'm starting to see wrinkles. Um, my teeth are stained. There are fewer places to go. I feel like I can't taste my food anymore. Um, I don't like, you know, the appearance of smoking. It's changing my appearance. Uh, my family is complaining. It's embarrassing. Some places where you go, I feel like a social outcast. Oh, another thing that'll come up, burn marks. They'll say, I got a new car and I burnt a hole in the seat. Or I got a new coat and I got a burn mark on it. That's frustrating to a smoker when they see that, that damage. Okay. So then what you're going to say is, okay, and let's pretend the person in front of us is not, has not set a quit date and is, not, is only mildly interested in the idea of quitting. Okay, so it's kind of far away. So we want to say, hey, I know that quitting is not on the near horizon for you right now, but if we could just kind of project out and think about it. When you think about quitting, what are some of the not so good things? What don't people like about quitting smoking? I'm going to gain weight. What else? Right? Thank you for saying that. That's usually the one I put in there because no one wants to say it. I can't go number two. Okay? Yep. 
And that's related to coffee, not the cigarette, just so you know. But when you smoke, you drink coffee, and it's coffee that helps you go number two in the morning, not the smoking. But if you've done them both together, you believe that to be true. What else? Not so good things about quitting. It's frustrating. What else? It's stressful. I'm triggered, right? It's hard to be around people who still smoke. I can never take a break. I'm just working all the time. Um, if they're not saying it, they should. It's expensive. And so you're going to hear that. It's expensive. Have you seen those medications? Okay, so they're going to say it's expensive. Because remember, you buy cigarettes in a daily dose, one pack one day. You buy NRT or other products in a month dose. If you bought your cigarettes in a month dose, it wouldn't be, uh, it, it, you would see the cost difference, but because we purchase things daily in terms of our smoking, but we ask you to purchase monthly in terms of your medication, it seems way off balance. What else don't people like about quitting? Yeah, there's, there's changes in, with friends and family. They'll make fun of us or they won't understand, but there's a, a friends and family issue there. Like meaning your, your attitude will change? Yes. So you'll hear people say, I tried to quit before and I was so mean, I kicked the dog. I mean, I did the horrible things to people that I would have never done. And they're scared to death of that. I had someone say to me once, I was working in Iowa doing a quit smoking group and this older gentleman said, I become so mean that I don't like myself and I have grandkids now and I don't ever want them to see that side of me. So I just, I will not quit again unless I know that that will not happen to me. So there are a lot of mood changes in that way that people are afraid of. Yeah, they might say that. You know, when I took that medication, I felt horrible. Yeah, so they're worried about that. So again, as this box becomes full, we do the same thing. So I'd read that back. Okay, I don't like the side effects of the medication. I'm going to gain weight. I won't be able to use the bathroom. No breaks at work. It's frustrating. It's stressful. My friends, my family do not understand. They're not supportive. They make fun of me. It's so expensive to quit. Um, I'm triggered by others who are smoking. My attitude changes completely, and my mood is all over the place. And then we do the final box. So what are some good things about quitting? Again, think from the smoker's perspective, not yours. Yes, money. Assuming I haven't spent it all on your quit smoking medications. Yes, I will save money. What else? Yeah, I can, I'm, I can come out into the light, right? No more sneaking around. I might be able to breathe easier. <laughs> you might hear them say, I can do more with my kids, right, because I'm not out of breath with kids or grandkids. Be example for my kids. Yeah, I might be an example for my kids. You might be able to get a better job. Yeah. Live longer, better job. What'd I hear? I'm going to smell better. The house will smell better. Some people will say they feel like they're going to have more time. Because when you're, like, again, go back to the video. Jean's smoking 50 cigarettes a day. That is time consuming. Even if she can, can smoke those things in two minutes, Normally it takes five to smoke a cigarette. Two times 50 is 100 minutes. That's a lot of time, okay, let alone the transport outside, the walk back in if she's doing this at work. It's a ton of loss of productivity. So they'll sometimes say, I feel like I'll have more time. But the same thing. As it gets full, we're waiting, and then we repeat it all back. So we're going to save some money. We might live longer. I might get a better job. Um, no more sneaking around. I might be able to breathe easier. I can do more with my kids and my grandkids. I'll be an example for my kids. I'm going to smell better. The house will be cleaner. Um, and I might have some more time. So once that's done, the magic then occurs because you're going to share some information. So it's called a decisional balance because the, this side of the, the paper, the not so good things about smoking and the good things about quitting, represent our reasons for change, right? These are the things we don't like about our current behavior, things we anticipate liking about the new behavior. The left-hand side, wait, is this, whatever, this side, I'm so confused because of how I'm standing. 
the good things about smoking and the not so good things about quitting are our reasons for staying the same. This is what we like about our current behavior and what scares us about the idea of change. Well, the idea behind a decisional balance is that we're supposed to tip a scale towards change. And right now, if you were to picture this as a scale, which side is heavier right now? Barely, though, right? Our scale might move like that. That's not enough to tip someone towards change. So what you often find is it's very even, which is why people feel like this, don't they? OK? So this is what it feels like on the inside. So to tip them towards change, you're going to do two things. First, you're going to help them recognize that all the good things about smoking are good things, period. For example, if we weren't talking about smoking, and I said, guys, there's this thing, OK? This thing, this magic thing, helps you relax, helps you with stress, calms your nerves, helps you fit in, gives you a fabulous excuse to take a break, makes you less anxious, keeps you from snacking and eating things you're not supposed to. It helps you have a routine. Um, it helps you concentrate. It keeps you from doing other bad things. It keeps you from going off on people, and it looks cool. Who doesn't want that thing? Whatever the thing is. So as soon as you recognize none of these things are bad, but there's another way to get them. You don't have to light something on fire in order to have these things in your life. What we want for people is to know that in a tobacco-free life, there are still ways to relax. There are still ways to calm your nerves. There are still ways to deal with your anger. There are still ways to fit in. There are still ways to help yourself concentrate. But when I'm talking to you about quitting smoking, you do not believe any of that to be true. And in fact, what you're afraid of is losing all of this. Their vision of a tobacco-free life is horrible, OK? So think, it feels, I think when they think about not smoking, they picture someone walking around like lost, dejected, no friends, the world is gray, they haven't laughed or smiled about anything. That's their picture. And if you are around a lot of smokers, you don't have a frame of reference. Or they picture us as unicorn people. Like, not smokers are just happy and stress-free and skipping around and thinking about rainbows, you know? So there's no, like, reality. So what you have to say is, all of these things are good, and I want them in your tobacco-free life. And when you do that, if this was a marker board, um, or if we were working with, with something else, these things then all move in to the good things about quitting. So typically, if I'm doing this on paper, I say, hey, when you quit, I still want you to be able to deal with your stress. I still want your nerves to be calm. I want to make sure your appetite's under control. I want to make sure you can deal with anger. I want to make sure that you still feel good about yourself. I want to make sure that you do have a routine, that you can concentrate, that you are less anxious. So essentially, what I'm doing is moving these items to this side of the scale, which now makes our scale heavier, right, towards change. But I'm telling you, it's not enough because these are our fears. And fears weigh more than other items. If we were literally thinking of weights on a scale, these are like big old rocks. These are like pennies, OK? This stuff is feather-like, OK? So you really have to say, OK, well, what are we going to do about this? And most of the time, the fears about quitting are almost all related to withdrawal and the unknown. So it's stuff that we're scared of. So through the skills, the knowledge that you have, you can say things like, you know, you mentioned being worried about gaining weight and mood change and not being able to sleep and being irritated. Those are the common signs of withdrawal. And remember how a couple of weeks ago I was talking about different medications that you could take? I don't know how many of you have had training on pharmacotherapy for, for tobacco, but basically all those medications do is help the brain stay in the happy nicotine zone. But what they don't do is replace, like, like if there were a feelings patch, we'd all be wearing the I Love a Day Long Conference feelings patch, right? right? Yeah, and like for the weekend, we'd be wearing I Love It When My Mother-in-Law Shows Up patch. Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh-huh. I Love Parenting a Teenager patch, right? OK, don't exist. Don't exist. Oh, oh, I'm coming undone. OK, sorry, the microphone walks away from the scarf, and then we can't video. I need a lot of help. Okay. Thank you, Dorian. OK. There you go. So then you can say to them, you know, these medications aren't perfect, but that's their job is to help you mitigate these things, to help you feel better. So let's talk about those again. 
if they are really, really worried about nutrition and weight gain, most of us in America are terrible when it comes to nutrition. We just don't know. Maybe you sign them up for a wellness program. Maybe you have dietitian services. You guys are part of a huge system where there are resources. Maybe you link them to those. And what happens is as you talk through these things, as you help me get answers to questions, you are essentially making these go away. And since I can't erase permanent marker, pretend that as I'm doing this, I'm erasing. And when that happens, you will then tip the balance all the way towards change. So does this happen in one day? Sometimes. I've done this, and it has been so impactful and powerful that the person is just like, oh, wow, I never thought about it this way. So what do you do? First of all, give them a copy. So if you spend all this time writing it down, know that they have to process all of this. So give them a copy and say, hey, take this, think about this, so that when we get together again, let's walk through it one more time. And, and what does this mean for you? Because this could be totally overwhelming in a positive way, like a light bulb kind of way, and we want to give them some space to deal with that. Second of all, you'd keep a copy because this is a gold mine of information about this person. So as you're thinking about, boy, what are their, what are their challenges going to be? What do I need to do in terms of maybe materials that I need to gather for them or people that I need to link them to or things that I want to talk to them about? You've got a list of things all over the place. I use this, like I said, in group or one-on-one. -on -one. I also use it for other big decisions. There was a time when my husband was changing jobs, okay? He didn't know if he wanted to take this new job. So we did the good things about staying at your current job, the not-so-good things about staying at your current job, the not-so-good things about going to the new place, and the good things about going to the new place. And what he learned was that the stuff he liked about his old job had nothing to do with his old job. It was things like, I have a great network of friends, um, I really enjoy it, it's, you know, no day is, is the same. All of those things lived over here. The stuff that he was afraid of about the employer all became questions he asked on the second interview. Ultimately, I mean, as a wife, I need you to know, it took me a minute, uh, my brain had to say, let's do this, because as a wife, I had one question. Guess what it was? Who's paying you more? Yeah, yeah. That's it. I'm just saying. That was my decision point, okay? So, but then I was like, well, he's still on the fence. I'm not, but he's still on the fence, so... Let me try something different. Remember, that's what we're committing to today is doing things a little differently. This was very, very helpful to him, powerful to him. He ended up switching jobs. It was very beneficial to him and his career and to us as a family. But he was really, really, really on the fence until he mapped all this out. You can use it with relationships. If you have your clients who are in these toxic relationships but can't seem to get out of them and they seem to, to invite the same person back into their lives over and over again, just a different version. With my clients... We decided everybody knows a Tony in their life, right? So we had the good things about staying with Tony. And if there's any Tonys in the room, I'm sorry. Uh, the not so good things about staying with Tony. The not so good things about leaving Tony. And the good things about leaving Tony. And boy, was that powerful. So this is a really, really great tool to use. And I hope that you now can put it into practice. Dorian has all of this electronically as well. So if you wrote on your copy today, no sweat. You, you're going to have it electronically. Modify it. Put it into use. Thoughts, feelings, reactions before we do our next activity. Thumbs up. I'm with it. Okay. All right. Good stuff. All right. So remember from this morning, there are three components, right, of motivation. First is importance. Second is confidence. And the third is readiness. So what I'm going to do is actually pose questions to you, and I need you to rate yourself. So I do want you to write on your copy, if you, if you would be so kind. If you don't have paper or a, or a writing utensil, you're going to use the candy at the table, and you can place it on your answer, okay, like bingo. We'll put a little bingo square on, on your spot. But if you have a pen, use the pen. You're going to put your professional hat on for me now. Normally, we would use this with our clients to try and get a better understanding of their, uh, their overall motivation. But I want you to do this about yourself right now, okay? So my first question is, thinking about the idea of importance, how important something is to you, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 it is, it is not important at all, and 10 is it is extremely important, how important is it for you 
to change the way you interact with patients after today? And I won't see your answer, so just tell the truth, okay? Just tell the truth. Either circle where you're at right now, or put a little piece of candy on it like bingo, whatever, whatever you want to do. And then I want you to think about something. If you were doing this with a client, you would say, tell me what that number means to you. So let's say you circle to six, okay? And I said, so what's a six mean to you? And you said, well, here's the thing, Gretchen. I work with a really difficult client population. And they have got so many things going on in their life. And um, just to be honest, where we work, we have 87 things that we have to do for the client in about three and a half minutes. And you're asking me what it feels like to do one more thing, okay? And I don't really feel like doing one more thing, even though you're very nice and I like you very much, Gretchen, okay? <laughs> but it's one more thing. So I'm just not sure today how I'm going to do that, okay? I say, okay. The reason you ask somebody to tell you what that number means is a six to me could be very different than a six to you. So we don't want to assume what that means to the person. You might hear six and think, well, that doesn't sound very important at all. But then they might say, well, six means I'm going to get on this. I just know I need to read some more. I got to get more comfortable. But boy, I love this, and I can't wait to take it and run with it. OK, that's what six meant to you. So we don't want to assume. Then the next question we ask is, OK, so you didn't say five. Tell me the difference. So we go one number lower and kind of get at that, why didn't you say five? And they might say, well, five feels wishy-washy, and I'm not wishy-washy, I'm ready to go. You know, like I said, I just got to get a couple things in place. And then the magic question, what's it going to take to make you a seven? So we ask, what will it take to make you one number higher? So think about that for just a minute yourselves. What did that number mean to you? You could jot down a note. How come you didn't say one number lower? And what's it going to take to make you one number higher? Because that's the magic question that people like Dorian and Dr. Marcotte and other people who are working with you to develop you as a professional and give you resources, they need to know. What's it going to take for something to shift for you? Okay? So if it's something like education or practice or training or reading material, write it down. Next question. Scale of 0 to 10. How confident are you in your ability to put these types of skills into practice tomorrow, where zero is I'm not confident at all, and 10 is I am extremely confident. Where would you put yourself? It's your belief in yourself, right? How confident are you that you could get it going tomorrow? Zero is not confident at all, 10, extremely confident. And then you say to yourself, what does that number mean? So if you circle a four or an eight, well, what does that mean exactly? And then we ask you, how come you didn't pick the number below? So if you picked a four, why didn't you say three? And then the magic question, what would it take to make you one number higher than where you are right now? And again, that's the information that your supervisors and your peers, people who can help you with this need to know. So is it again, I don't know, sometimes I really, stumble with these clients. You know, they really uh, seem so upset. I don't know how to handle that. Or um, I just don't know that I'm great at, at delivering information or connecting with them on this level. I've never done that before. It, it, again, just be honest with yourself so that we can figure out how to best help you. And then the third question, if we needed to ask it, but basically I always look at just the top two. If something is important enough and confident enough, then you're probably ready. But if those are out of balance, you're not. So we don't even have to do the third one together in terms of your readiness. So in thinking through all of that, what you want to concentrate on is the lowest number in front of you. So if your confidence is lower than importance, I really don't need to build your importance. I need to spend time on your confidence. So think about your patient who says to you, Oh, yeah, it's a seven. I know I need to quit. I've been doing this too long. It's too expensive. They rattle off all the reasons. Okay, tell me what seven means to you. Why didn't you say six? What would it take to make you an eight? You gather all that info because it's going to give you a ton of info. And then you say, well, how are you with your confidence? Where are you on that scale? They say, oh, where are the negative numbers, right? I give myself a negative three. If they do that, write that down, write negative three. 
So, okay, well, tell me about negative three. Whew, I think I've tried to quit five times, and every time it's a disaster. I last about one day before I'm ready to kill somebody, um, uh, and I feel crazy, and I've eaten every piece of candy in the office, and it's just horrible. I hate the way I feel. And so all I can think about with quitting is how I, I can't seem to get through that. It's horrible. So if I'm working with you, do I really need to boost your importance? Not really. I need to spend my time, my energy, my effort on figuring out how to boost your confidence. That's what this tool does for us. It tells us where to put our energy. Again, for those of you who only have four minutes with a person, you have to maximize what you do in those four minutes in terms of effectiveness. And so if I can figure out right away that your area of, of concern is not having any confidence in yourself to get this done, then I don't need to waste the air in the room talking to you about all the benefits of quitting. I can give that to you on a piece of paper when I give you that awesome workbook that Cradle has put together, right? So I need to say, okay, Gretchen, what is holding you back? Tell me more about that. Help me understand what's, what's getting in the way of you feeling good. What can I do? Those are always the most powerful questions. How can I help you? What do you need from me? You can do scaling one-on-one -on -one, or you can do it in a group. When I do it in a group, though, one change I make. Any of you do group counseling? Nobody does. Okay, well, you can ask me after how I do it in a group for sake of time. So, what? Oh, okay, great. Very quickly, in group, what happens is people's opinions will influence one another. So what I do is I draw the scale up on a whiteboard or a flip chart, and then I hand everybody a tiny piece of paper and have them write their number on it and then hand it back to me, okay? Because what will happen is if the first person, when I say how important is it for you to quit smoking, if the first person has decided they're going to they're gonna make uh, this day real hard for me, you know, they're like, one, you know, and the person next to them had written a five, but, you know, this is their best friend, and they're like, um, uh, two, you know, so instead, I take the pieces of paper and I read them off. They don't have anybody's name on it, and I make hash marks along the scale. I say, okay, oh, we've got a one, uh, we've got a seven, we've got a four, we have another four, we have a three, and we have an eight. It's almost always the rule of thirds where people are at. And then I start with the high numbers first. So for those of you who picked seven and eight, tell me what seven or eight means to you. And then I go down to the people who are at the low end. Okay, for those of you who picked a one and two, what does a one and two mean to you? And the people in the middle, uh, fours and fives, what does four and five mean to you? I do it because we got to end in uh, middle ground. So you start with the people who are unicorns and rainbows, right? Go down to the Eeyores and the Debbie Downers, and then come back to our middle of the road people. And that's on purpose. You do not end with the ones and the twos. It makes it much harder to dig out of that hole. Okay, you do the same thing with confidence, hash marks, have people talk about it. And what I like to do with this is do it at the beginning of group and then do it at the end. Erase it in between so they can't remember what their answers are, throw the pieces of paper away, and then see where they're at because things can shift just within one group session. So a great technique, again, to start using immediately. A lot of your clients, whether you know it or not, have learning challenges. They will not come in the door diagnosed but many of them probably have undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. If you have used other substances, if you have gotten into fist fights, if you have had a car wreck, if you have had nutritional deprivation for many years, all sorts of things, your brain is not the same as everyone else's brain. And one thing that is hard for you is to remember stuff. So anything you can do where there is a pen and a piece of paper and engaging in the activity with them, it helps them learn. Give them a copy if possible. Um, do things on a board or a piece of paper. Stop relying upon the verbal message because a person who has a learning challenge, a mild one or a traumatic brain injury, doesn't look any different than anybody else and they have become accustomed to faking it and they look like this. Like when I ask all of you, does that make sense? You do the same thing to me, I don't know. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. And then afterwards, what did she say? No idea, yeah, yeah. Like my students, right, my undergrads, yeah, yeah. Okay, does everybody get it, yeah. Uh, okay, so tell me what I just said. Oh, right, okay. Our clients are the same way, so techniques like this are very, very helpful and powerful. Okay, so you're doing, you're doing great. What's in the slides is that dialogue that I just did with you verbatim, okay, so that you have it so you can remember what the questions are. So, and we did decisional bounce, so we're moving right along. Okay, so what I'd like us to do now, if we have time, yes, we do, we have just enough time. At your table, work with the person next to you as your partner, 
And we are going to actually engage um, in, first of all, a little change plan, okay? So we're gonna work on a plan for change. So the change plan is what's gonna come around, okay? So some of you in your work probably do treatment plans, right? So conceptually, a change plan is similar. It's how we come up with a plan for change. And in this case, for us in the room, this plan for change is about us changing how we're gonna interact with patients. So I want you thinking about, and the reason you're gonna have a partner is because I want you to talk to one another, okay? And you're each gonna fill out your own change plan, but you're gonna go ahead and dialogue with one another about each item on here. So I'm gonna give you five solid minutes to fill out as much of this as possible. Well, today we're gonna to make it about us, okay? So if everyone is clear, I want you to make this about you. Just like I scaled you about your comfort with using these skills, this is your change plan of how you're gonna start interacting with your clients differently using this skill set. So five minutes, here you go. The idea behind the change plan is that you're walking through this idea of what do I want to do? What's my goal, right? And you'll notice the questions on here are things about what are some actions I could take, right, specifically to get me to that goal? What are some things that are gonna get in the way? What are some barriers that I might encounter? And so it's meant to help a person begin to think forward about the future. So. We did this on ourselves because again, so many times when you go to a training, workshop, or conference, the hope is that you take what you learned and you can apply it immediately. That does not always happen. And some of it's because we don't spend any time kind of reflecting on ourselves and saying, okay, I get this, but what's it gonna take for me to actually make it happen? Oh, gosh, uh, three things I could do. Um, one, maybe I'm gonna go ahead and ask if I can get some more training. 
maybe I'm going to go ahead and read um, one of the many articles on motivational interviewing or books, right? Maybe I want to talk to my supervisor because I know they're trained in motivational interviewing. It, so you think of things that you can do. And then if you start to say, okay, well, then what's going to get in the way? It might be that you, again, say, well, I just feel like this is too new to me and I don't exactly know uh, what I'm doing. So, you know, that, that's a barrier. Or, you know, I really feel like the job that they've asked me to do, I don't have any time or opportunity to talk to the client. Um, whatever those barriers are, put them out there. And then what I'm going to do is challenge you on something. When you're thinking about your barriers, make a little note. Are they a barrier because of it's, a, it's a skill that you don't have? Or is it a barrier because of a personal issue? And the reason I ask you this is, there are two ways to fix things. If it's a barrier because I don't have the skills, then I ask to be trained. I read, I go to a workshop, something like that. If it's a personal issue, no amount of training is going to fix that. You have work to do. Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to journal. Maybe you need to pray over this to figure out what's holding me back. And there's no shame in any of that. It's just it's a different route in terms of getting over that exact barrier. If you were doing this with the client, it would be the same process. You'd be asking them about things like, so what are some things you could do? What are some things that are going to get in the way? If those things show up, how do we want to address them? You're helping them through the same process. If change was easy, none of us would be in this room. People would not need our help if change was easy. So it's tangled. It's messy. It's not obvious. And things like this plan help make things less messy and tangled and all over the place and start putting them into more realistic terms. So for sake of time, what, went out, what got handed out to you now is an example of a two-minute conversation that you could have immediately. I wrote it for you word for word last week. This is for you to have with your next client, okay? If you haven't talked to them about smoking, this will get that conversation started. If you have talked to them and it didn't go so well, this will make that conversation better. So if you take a look at this dialogue, notice it's full of MI. We've got the scaling questions in there. We've got open-ended questions about your reasons, your needs, how might you go about doing this. So this is something that you could use. It should take you two minutes or less when you're having that conversation for those of you concerned with time and give you a ton of information to start using in your next visit with them, or if you do have an extended time, to start moving forward. So that's, this is an example of an MI-based conversation. I would challenge you to, to test it. And when you test it, make notes about what worked well, what didn't work so well, what didn't I understand, maybe what could I have done better, and then ask for some more guidance on that. You had your hand up. No, because this is what they'll say. I'm nowhere. You're like, oh. And then you're going to use your skills, and you're going to say, tell me what that means. So I used to give people a visual, and I would say, think of quitting like running a race, where there's a start line and there's a finish line. Where are you? And I had a client say, Miss Gretchen, if I'm being honest with you, I'm at home under the covers, and I'm not answering your call. <laughs> I says, okay. I know exactly where you're at, though, right? And I said, okay. What would it take to get you out from under the covers? Baby step, right? I think I'd have to know this. What would it take to get you to answer my call? This. Okay, next time we saw each other, I did the same thing. She said, I'm not hiding under the covers anymore, Miss Gretchen. I'm in my car watching other people line up. I said, okay. Tells me exactly where they're at. So you can really be creative, and I push you to do so, because sometimes that frees people up to just tell you the truth and say, I know I need to do this, but I hate everything about it. Okay, that's what I want to hear. Tell me more about that. And I encourage you to not problem solve right away. Say those words. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? Because it'll give you so much information very quickly. So to kind of close here, this is the kind of stuff I hear about when I train people on this. I hear the whole, I don't have time to have a long conversation with the patient. And I'm not prepared for them to open up and tell me lots of things that I don't want to hear. And frankly, Gretchen, this sounds like therapy, and I don't do therapy. Okay, this is what I hear. 
So my response is, of course, well, friends, because we're all friends at this point. The time we have the pa with the patient is precious. I get that. And we certainly don't have time to smack up against resistance over and over again. So in a time crunch, which we're all in, you want to be incredibly effective and efficient. So you have to get to the heart of the matter, and I'm from West Virginia originally, right quick. Okay, that's how we say it. Get to it right quick. Okay. And last I checked, my job was to assist people in making some kind of major change. That's what we're hired to do. So you better figure out how to get that done, and it may involve a minute of conversation. We got to break down our own biases, because trust me, the client isn't complaining that you talk to them too nicely. That's not their complaint. It's that no one listens to them. So they aren't the ones saying, oh, I, I just wish someone would actually understand me. Okay, they're not complaining like that. They're, they are saying, I wish they'd take the time to get to know me. So remember that, that it's us that's the barrier most of the time. It's our fears, it's our concerns. We are ambivalent about change as well. So here's what you do. If they do open up, so when I'm teaching my students, I call it the volcano, right? You say something like, so Dr. Hammond, how are you today? And I say, oh gosh, you have no idea. Okay, let me just tell you, this whole day was crazy. I came down here, it was snowing. Nobody here can drive, first of all. Can we just say that, okay? And then I get a call from one of my kids that they forgot something at home and they're asking me where it's at. Well, I'm not there, ask your dad. Why does everyone have to call me and ask me where things are? Like I've memorized where everybody's socks are at, okay? It's just maddening. And then one of the dogs got out and they had to get the dog back and I've told them about 87 times, don't leave the gate open, the dogs go out, but no one listens to me ever, right? So I'm just telling you, I've been feeling all kinds of stress. My heart is racing, my stomach hurts. And I just haven't been feeling like myself lately, okay? That's called the volcano. So when that happens, what you need to understand is while you all know the table of organization where you work, the client does not. You just work at the place. You work at Good Sam, you work at Children's, you work for Cradle, you work at the health department. They don't know your job description and your job title. They see you as a helper. So if that happens, take a moment and say, thank you for sharing that with me, okay? Okay, so that must be hard for you. I'm here to help with and define your role. I'm here to help you with this. I can provide you with a referral to assist you with these other things. You don't have to help them with everything. Just take a moment, let them know what you can do, and tell them you'll get them connected to somebody who can do that. So you don't have to worry about them just blowing up and telling you their life story. They'll probably do that on average for two minutes, and then you can wrap it up neatly with a bow for them. And then my final notes, because there's people at the door, is for you to remember that it's really hard to change when you have an addiction, and smoking is an addiction. And any major disease process has three pieces to it. Physical, meaning you are physically dependent upon nicotine. There's no way, shape, or form to argue against that. The brain changes, you have cravings, it's there. The second component is that this drug is a lover and a friend. It's been there since you were 11 years old. It's been through good times and bad. It's outlasted marriages. It's there. But also, you've learned to cope with every feeling that you have with a cigarette. Happy, fat, angry, mad, lonely, tired, bored, smoke. And so over time, it is your emotional everything. And then the third component is that social and behavioral part of the addiction where you learn that when, for Mr. Coffee to brew, there has to be a lit cigarette. For the car to start, there has to be a lit cigarette. And for the dog to go outside, there has to be a lit cigarette. That's what you do to your brain. And so if we're going to help people quit, you have to address all three, the physical dependence, the emotional connections, and the retraining, if you will, of learning how to be a non-smoker. So if we're going to be effective, that's what we need. So some food for thought. Remember, most people that you're seeing don't want to destroy their health. They're not trying to hurt the baby. They're not trying to hurt themselves. They feel stuck, and they often have deep emotional connections to their health problem. So when we ask people to make lifestyle changes, they feel overwhelmed, and these are the reasons that hold them back. So all of your advice and your expertise is wasted if you cannot connect with them. And motivational interviewing is maybe the most efficient and effective way to connect with them, and overall, it makes life easier for you. Guys, thank you. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Godspeed.